Brown will has been and will continue to be in our prayers until he recovers. As many of you know, I work there at the same place as Mark over at Bomb Shelter Diesel. That usually raises eyebrows for some folks. And uh, nowadays, rightly so. Uh, but this, this place of work for me affords me several blessings. Um, obviously, it's a source of income. But mainly, more importantly, I'm able to teach people the gospel. Now, I'm in the warehouse, and there's five or six of us there. And when, when they first got there, because I was there before most of them, they would bring up certain religious issues, and I would answer them from the scriptures. They don't ask very many questions anymore. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why. But uh, either way, we have truck drivers. They pick up freight for us. I'm usually the one that's either packing orders or loading the trucks up with the forklifts, or both. So I, I had the opportunity to talk to some of the drivers. Well, one of them, we call him Yaman, because he, he always says Yaman whenever something's going on. He's from Belize, pretty cool dude. Um, he's a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So me and him have had a few discussions. And oddly enough, he doesn't want to talk to me very much anymore. Uh, but before all that happened, he doesn't know something that I know. I bought his book. Or at least the book that he and his religious body goes by. So this morning I'd like to uh, discuss the Seventh-day Adventist Church, some of the doctrines they teach and live by. After all, as Christians, we're charged to give an answer to every man that asketh the reason of the hope that is in us. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. We're also commanded to earnestly contend for the faith, Jude 3. And by Paul's example, we're commanded to be set for the defense of the gospel, Philippians 1, verse 7. Now, from their book, on page 9, this is starting of their beliefs. Seventh-day Adventists accept the Bible as their only creed, their only creed, and hold certain fundamental beliefs to be the teaching of the Holy Scriptures. These beliefs have set forth here, here, constitute the church's understanding and the expression of the teaching of the Scripture. Revision of these statements may be expected at a general conference session when the church is led by the Holy Spirit to a fuller understanding of the Bible, truth, or finds better language in which to express the teachings of God's holy word. That, that kind of cracks me up. Well, anyways, we want to look at their origins. Where did this church actually begin? How it began? <clears throat> well, oddly enough, it began with a Baptist preacher by the name of William Miller. His teachings would actually eventually lead to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. From this point forward, we'll just call them SDA. He studied prophecy and concluded through his studies that the world would end on March 21st, 21st 1843. It didn't. And then later on, he concluded again that March 21st of 1844, the world would end. Well, again, he was wrong. This occurrence was considered the great disappointment. Well, he decided to prophesy again, and 1845 was his new end of the world prophecy. At this point, many of his followers fragmented. They decided to break loose from his teachings and go separate ways. However, some of those who did remain faithful to him uh, from these fragments, the SDA church was founded, uh, mainly by Ellen G. White, who along with her family, she was a loyal follower of the, the Miller movement. And she later became the uh, leader of the Millerite movement, as it is termed. <coughs> In 1847, she had a vision in which she was taken to heaven and saw the Ten Commandments. The fourth 
which is keep the Sabbath holy, was circled in a fiery halo. She thus concluded that Sabbath keeping was essential for the believers. Thus, the name Seventh day Adventist was adopted by the Millerites in 1860. And in 1863, this entity was officially organized and was recognized as its own entity. Now, there are a couple things, three, that we can agree on when they teach. They teach that the scriptures are inspired by God. Two, they believe in the literal Genesis creation account and oppose evolution. And third, they oppose the use of alcohol, tobacco, and other harmful and unprescribed drugs. That's great, but that's where it ends. Their false doctrine, and we'll spend a large portion of this time on this subject. Again, from their book, on page 15, we have here, The great principles of God's law are embodied in the Ten Commandments and exemplified in the life of Christ. They express God's love, will, and purposes concerning human conduct and relationships, and are abiding upon all people in every age. These precepts are the basis of God's covenant with His people and the standard in God's judgment. Through the agency of the Holy Spirit, they point out sin and awaken a sense of need for a Savior. Salvation is of all grace and not of works, but its fruitage is obedience to the commandments. This obedience develops Christian character and results in a sense of well-being. It is an evidence of our Lord for the, or our love for the Lord and our concern for our fellow men. The obedience of faith demonstrates the power of Christ to transform lives and therefore strengthens Christian witnesses. Thank you very much, sir. So that's their definition, at least, for the law of God. Now they... They teach, you can gather from that, they teach that the law of Moses and the law of God are two separate entities. And they consider everything that the law of Moses, that Moses said, was a ceremonial part of the law. And that it was done away with, nailed to the cross, according to Colossians 2.14. Furthermore, the law of God is found in the Ten Commandments. Now, I'd like to use this quote from Brother Jess Whitlock. Let your fingers do the walking and let the scriptures do the talking. I like that when I heard that from him. Nehemiah disagrees with Seventh-day Adventist Church. Chapter 8, verses 1 and 8 says, And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. So they read in the book, in the law of God, distinctly, and gave the sense that caused them to understand the reading. <coughs> Ezra chapter 7, verse 6 says, This Ezra went up from Babylon, and he was a ready scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. And the king granted him all his requests according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him. Second Chronicles chapter 34 verse 14. And when they brought out the money that was brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found a book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. In each of these passages, the law of Moses and the law of God, these terms are synonymous. You cannot separate them the way SDA tries to. Now, as far as sacrifices are concerned, I asked, well, his name is Tomas. I don't remember his last name, but yeah, man. I asked him whether or not he performs animal sacrifices when he gathers for worship. Like most people do when I ask interesting questions like that, like, what are you talking about? It looks like I'm crazy. Well, he's probably true in some aspects, but he didn't really have an answer. But after he said that, after he asked if I was crazy, he said, that's part of the ceremonial law. That's part of the law of Moses. We don't go by that because Colossians 2.14 says it's been nailed to the cross. Well, according to Second Chronicles chapter 31, verse 3, animal sacrifices are part of the 
law of God. Second Chronicles 31, verse 3. He appointed also the king's portion of his substance for the burnt offerings, to wit, for the morning and evening burnt offerings, and the burnt offerings for the Sabbaths, and, the, and for the new moons, and for the set feasts, as is written in the law of the Lord. Moreover, he commanded the people that dwelt in Jerusalem to give the portion of the priests and the Levites, that they might be encouraged in the law of the Lord. And also... Luke chapter 2 verse 24, Jesus said, And to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So Jesus plainly stated that the law of Moses was the law of God and that the law of animal sacrifices is a part of the law of God. Jesus also taught that the fifth of the Ten Commandments was said to be for Moses. Mark chapter 7, verses 9 through 10. And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. For Moses said, Honor thy father and thy mother, and whoso curseth father or mother, let him die the death. So Jesus doesn't distinguish between the two. Jesus says the commandments came from Moses. It's the law of the Lord. They're synonymous terms. As far as their name goes, Seventh-day Adventist, they obviously like the seventh day, Sabbath keeping. <clears throat> now, poor little Ellen G. White, she was nine years old. I, wherever she was, I don't know, she was, I guess, playing with friends, and she ended up getting hit in the head with a rock. Shortly thereafter, she had visions, hallucinations. That's when she started having the fiery halo dream of the Sabbath being up in heaven. Well, that's why they keep harping on Sabbath keeping. It's because she is their prophet. She is self-ordained that she's God's mouthpiece. Now, they would disagree, obviously, with the apostles' teaching that we are commanded to worship the saints on the first day of the week. Acts chapter 20, verse 7, as well as 1 Corinthians Chapter 16, verses 1 through 2. To take this a little further, he said, not only should you worship on the Sabbath, but it has to be Saturday. Now, I always like to ask questions, and why do you say what you say, and why do you do what you do? Well, that, that's a big deal. It might not sound like it, but it is. He's saying you must worship on Saturday. Well, I asked about other countries, other cultures. For instance, the Spanish calendar begins on Monday or lunes. Well, seventh day of the week for them is Sunday. So they would ha if they go by him, they would have to worship on the Sabbath and Sunday. I thought that was interesting. But he's binding where some things ought not be bound. He's saying Saturday worship is essential, not just Sabbath. But again, I gave him examples of Acts 20, verse 7, and 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. He didn't like it. He said, well, where is Sunday mentioned in the Bible? I said, it's not. It says first day of the week. And then I went with the culture aspect of it. God doesn't command certain things specifically because culture changes. It says first day of the week. We have different names than they might have during this, this time of the commandments given. If it was Tuesday and if it was our first day of the week, that would be a scriptural day of worship. It just so happens that Sunday is our first day of the week in this country. Like we said, Spain, they use lunes. Or Monday is their first day of their calendar week. Then if they're going to be scripturally worshiping God, they must worship on Monday. <clears throat> and I, I also kept asking him this question for which he had no response are you a Jew are you a member of the tribes of Israel no what are you talking about do I look like Israelite no that's the whole point of my question but again he didn't like it he didn't really like most of my questions but when you consider Exodus chapter 31, verses 12 through 17. 
you see who this law was given to. Again, Exodus 31, verses 12 through 17 says, <clears throat> And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbath you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy unto you. Every one that defileth it shall surely be put to death. For whosoever doeth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh, which is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord, whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. <clears throat> that plainly states that the law of Moses, the law of God, these are synonyms, were given only to the, the Israelites. Cited also Deuteronomy chapter 5 verses 1 through 15. He also didn't like when I called the Ten Commandments a covenant. The whole law of God, a covenant. Exodus chapter 34, verses 27 through 28 states, And the law said unto Moses, excuse me, the Lord said unto Moses, Write thou these words. For after the tenor of these words, I made a covenant with thee and with Israel. And he was there with the Lord forty days and forty nights. He didn't either eat bread nor drink water, and he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. And also Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 12 through 13, which reads, The Lord spake unto you out of the midst of the fire. Ye heard the voice of the words, but saw no similitude, only ye heard a voice. And he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, even the Ten Commandments. And he wrote them upon two tables of stone. It's a covenant better for us to understand like a contract God drafted a contract <coughs> children of Israel had the opportunity to either reject or accept that and through their obedience they essentially signed it and as long as they were obedient they were amenable to the things in that contract supported scripture is 1 Kings 8 chapter or excuse me chapter 8 verses 9 as well as 2 Chronicles Chapter 5, verse 10, as well as chapter 6 and 11. The covenant, this entire law system, which includes the Sabbath law, was to be abolished. It was prophesied that it would end. Jeremiah chapter 31, beginning in verse 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers, in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law into their inward parts, and write in their hearts, and will be their God. And they shall be my people, and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I remember their sin no more. That's not saying we're all going to have special knowledge of God. That's before you enter into the family of God, you will already be taught about God. When you're an Israelite, you're born into the family. You don't have much choice in what law you're under. You can choose to disobey it, but you're born a Jew. As Christians, we're heathen once we decide to disobey God. And then we study about God. Therefore, we come to knowledge of God. And then when we obey His commands, then we're added to the family. And that's what this passage is getting at. And also, Zechariah chapter 11, verses 10 through 14. Hebrews chapter 8 verses 6 through 13 as well as chapter 9 verses 15 through 17 Hosea 2 11 and 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verses 7 through 11 that never gets old 
All these scriptures point to the abolishment of the covenant. The ending of the Sabbath law, essentially. Now, if this law is to be abolished, and it was, we're not lawless, so what law are we under? Well, the law of Christ. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 9 through 10. This passage says, Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second by the which we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. This new law requires priests. Still in Hebrews, but moving up to chapter 7, beginning in verse 11, If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek, which is Jesus, and not be called after the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe, of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, and of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning the priesthood. <clears throat> and it is yet far more evident, for that after the similitude of Melchizedek there arises another priest, who is made not after the law of a carnal or fleshly commandment, but after the power of an endless life. Now who are the priests under this law? Well, those are Christians. Chapter 2, verse 9 of 1 Peter. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, an holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So we... We see that the law of God, the law of Moses are synonymous. And all the laws contained within them, they were also abolished. But now we're under the law of Christ. Now, enough with their false doctrine. Let's look at their, essentially their founder. Their prophetess, Ellen G. White. She claimed to be inspired of God. To the Seventh-day Adventist, the SDA, her words are still considered to be inspired and very much like the Bible. <clears throat> God tells us who, whom, whom He has spoken through, and it's not Ellen G. White. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 2. God, who at sundry times and diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by His Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he had made the worlds. Ellen G. White is not mentioned in that passage. Nor is Muhammad, nor is Joseph Smith, John Calvin, just Jesus Christ. We're told that the scriptures gives us all things pertaining to life and godliness. Second Peter chapter one, verse three. If there's anything else out there that they claim is going to help us, it's not true. God's Word provides all things for us per name under life and godliness. The Scriptures were once for all time delivered to the saints. Jude verse 3. And the Scriptures thoroughly furnish us unto all good works. 2 Timothy 3, 16-17. Any addition to this is simply false. And those people who do such things will have to answer it for on Judgment Day, Revelation 22, 17 through 19. And the scriptures also tell us that no other gospel would come, not even from an angel. Galatians chapter 1, beginning in verse 6. Paul says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another gospel, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, Preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you. Let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed or cut off from God. It's a very strong statement. But people like Ellen G. White, they're accursed. They're trying to add to the scriptures that God gave in the first century. She was Not only was she a prophet, 
but she was a false prophet. Uh, one of the things she mentioned in her prophecies was that slavery would never be abolished. I'm thankful in this country she's wrong. We don't have slavery anymore. Due to the courage of few, slavery was abolished. <clears throat> now, thankfully, God tells us how to deal with such prophets. Or any prophet for that matter. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 20 through 22. But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, that is God's name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. And if thou say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. But the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. That's how you test a false prophet. By their fruits ye shall know them. If that prophet says something, nothing happens. That prophet's a liar. That prophet does not speak for God. Now, why does any of this matter? I mean, I got up here and wasted a lot of hot air. Why does it matter to any of us as Christians? Well, as we stated at the beginning of this particular talk, Christians are commanded to be able to defend the faith. Jude 3 and Philippians 1 verse 17. We're also supposed to give an answer for the hope within us. 1 Peter 3.15 Now in this particular lesson we've done at least two things. First and foremost we've proved from the scriptures that the doctrines that SDA teach and live by are false. And thus we have shown that their religious body is not the body of Jesus Christ. Those are important key factors. Thus any who believe or follow after said doctrine are now and will continue to be lost in sin until they repent of such actions. We point out the origins of the Seventh-day Adventist Church earlier. Its founding in history is much too late. Jesus promised to build his church. That word church is singular. Not churches, but church. Matthew chapter 16, beginning in verse 13. Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi. He asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some say Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the, hates of, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The church that Jesus promised to build was founded on Pentecost. That's when it began. Any other entity that formed before it or after it is not the church that Jesus promised to build. And whether some wish to see it or not, but the church, the body of Christ, is alive and well. Now those, those Jews that heard the lessons from the apostles that day, they heard these teachings. And these teachings caused them to have faith. Romans 10 verse 17. Acts 2 says they were pricked in their hearts. Their consciences said, you are in violation of a standard. You should feel bad. And guess what they did? Peter told them in Acts 2.38, in response to their question, what shall we do? Peter says, repent and be baptized. And upon following these steps, they were added to the church by the Lord, Acts 2.47. Just like every faithful believer that wishes to believe in Christ and be obedient to Him through baptism, They'll, add, they'll be added to the church as well. If you're concerned about your soul, and where that soul will spend an eternity, good for you. That's a good thing to be considering. It's a good thing to be worried about. If this is the case and you're not a Christian, follow the same steps that these 3,000 did. And if you remain faithful, 
Revelation 2.10, heaven will one day be your home. However, if you're already a Christian, but you have allowed sin to come back into your life, there's a remedy for that as well. Acts chapter 8, verse 22. When Simon, the, sor the former sorcerer, sinned before Peter, ultimately before God, he was commanded to repent and pray. He did. And once he did that, he was restored to a faithful child of God. And once he dies, if he remained faithful, he'll be granted heaven as well. So if you have either of these needs, whether you wish to become a Christian for the very first time, or if you stumbled in your Christian walk, repentance and prayer. We'll pray for you, pray with you, that you'll be restored as a faithful child of God. Or if you simply need prayers. It's a difficult world out there. We have struggles within, struggles without, people trying to tear us down. If you need prayers of strength, let us know. We're your brothers and sisters. Either way, if there be any need, come forward and let us know as we stand and sing. Ye famishing, ye will.